Hey, uh, we are in the middle of this fall series called No Agendas, Just Jesus, all right? And uh, if you're here today and you you may be uh, just starting your journey with God uh, or you're just here kind of checking us out or you're in town and the people that you stayed with, you know, they go to church and, and you're, whatever reason why you're here, um, if you don't consider yourself a, a very religious person, we are so glad you're here because if you spend a little bit of time with us, you're going to see we're not very religious either, okay? Uh, and so sit back and, and relax. And uh, we've been doing this series because um, we just feel like um, over the next couple of uh, uh, weeks and months where we felt like we needed to repaint a picture of Jesus for those who, to whom that picture may have been tainted. And we, we talked last month about how Jesus came to challenge old thinking and about God and, and distant and cold and uncaring thinking about God. And so today, here's our big idea that I want you to write down. I want you to know that all of our comments are going to be, uh, going to be tailored around this one thought is this, that the God of the Bible is the God who invites. Okay? He's all the time reaching out, all the time talking to people, all the time inviting. Uh, I, I had a guy yesterday at the gym uh, who was talking to me, and he goes, Hey, man, just want to let you know I'm going to be bringing my girlfriend uh, today, and she's had like a bad experience in church. And uh, he goes, But I told him, I said, Look, it's different at my church, man. We love everybody. We don't care where you're from, what your experience was. And then he almost proceeded to kill me on uh, on a bicep workout. Uh, but, you know, it was worth um, uh, worth taking it for the Lord, uh, you know, just to be able to, uh, I mean, this guy's uh, about uh, fixing to make my biceps explode. But um, I, I love the fact that our God is a God who invites. Uh, three years ago, I got one of the most precious invitations that I've ever gotten in my life, Okay. Uh, I'll never forget when I was invited to a, t- uh, to a banquet uh, in 2012 because I was told that I had been selected to be part of the Daphne High School Hall of Fame, okay? So um, I fought back tears whenever I'm, I'm, reading the, <laughs> when I'm reading the invitation. They said, hey, look, we want you to bring your friends and your family. I mean, we just want to honor you with a free meal and everything. And here's what's, so kind, of, what's kind of funny is that most of my friends who played sports with me will tell you that my athletic accomplishments did not merit such an honor, all right? There are two things I think they have questioned about my life. Number one, they questioned me going into ministry. They're like, Stafford? Honest to God, Stafford is a a minister? And then the other thing was, he got into the Hall of Fame. He was terrible, all right? And so uh, I think um, uh, it it meant so much to me because I knew there were so many more people who were so much better than me. And that night, whenever I gave my acceptance speech, uh, I just said something. I said, look, I'm not the best Trojan to ever play here, but I guarantee you one thing, you're never going to find a prouder one, all right? Um, that invitation meant so much uh, to me, and, and it still amazes me because of the elite athletes and role models uh, that, that are in there and that I'm a part of it as well. Here's one of the things I want to show you today is that you cannot, you and I, we cannot read the Bible and not see God inviting people all the time. In the Old Testament, he's talking in, through this prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And he says, listen, listen, while you were doing all these things, declared the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called to you, but you did not answer. And he speaks through another guy by the name of Isaiah. And he's, he's bringing it real uh, easy to everybody at this time. He goes, look, come now, let's settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool. God is a God who's inviting uh, people into his presence. Say, hey, look, dude, I just, I want to I, I get to know you. And I want you to get to know me. And then Jesus comes along and he's all the time inviting people. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. All right. I see that people are exhausted a lot of times because they're worn down by religion. And Jesus said, hey, look, all that stuff you heard about my dad, it's not, it's not true. That's why you're worn down. If you come and you take, take my teaching, I'm going to give you some rest. And then he says uh, later on in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he says, come follow me and I'm, I'll send you out to fish for people. And then one day at this feast, he, he calls out to everybody. He, he says, on the last greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anybody who's thirsty come to me and drink. We see that God all throughout the scriptures is regularly inviting people to come and have a life with him. And one day he tells a story about this, okay? Um, 
he's talking about how God is a God who loves to throw parties. All right? So he, the way that he would relate to people and the way I relate to people a lot, you're never going to leave here and say, what a theologically profound message. You know, I, I, I you're going to leave there and say, oh, man, that was a cool story when we told that about that. I try to teach like Jesus, you know. And so uh, Jesus is talking about, he's like, man, God loves to have people in for a party and just, and just uh, and celebrate life with them. And he said, let me just tell you this story. One day there was this, there was this guy, he was a wealthy landowner, and his son was getting married, all right? And he goes, let me just illustrate this point that there's always room for one more. And he tells a story about a man who's preparing this wedding feast for his son. It says in Luke chapter 14, it says, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is ready. Now watch this. In Jesus' day, because they didn't have clocks, what they would do, they would send out an invitation and it would be like, hey, save this date on your calendar. All right? And then later on, whenever it, the food was ready, he would send a servant and say, hey, everything's ready. Come on, let's grub, let's party down. And uh, the one thing that uh, I love so much about uh, reading the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is that you can surmise this very quickly. The God uh, of the Jews and the Gentiles loves to party. All right? That's my kind of God. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, some of y'all know. I'm talking about good party. I'm not talking about, you know, you know them left-handed cigarettes and stuff like that you used to, uh, used to pass whenever you were... That wacky tobacco. Come on, somebody y'all know what I'm talking about, all right? So anyway, uh, so they're having this thing. And so uh, whenever the food was ready, uh, they would come in and they would, they would send somebody to let them know it was ready. Look at verse 18. It says this. But they all began to make excuses. The people who had gotten the invitation originally. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Okay, who buys a field without first seeing it? All right. Then another one said, I just bought five yokes of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Yeah, try them out, but you've already paid the bill. Boy, that's a weak excuse. <laughs> Here's my favorite excuse. It said this, please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married. All right. He's throwing his wife under the bus, you know? And so uh, they all knew the date. They knew the man had been spending his own money on this and was planning this huge night, this huge event, and their excuses are all based on convenience. The first two excuses were based on the fascination that some people have with their new toys. You know what? Man, I got this brand new boat. And it's totally cool. Yes, use your boat to the glory of God and invite your pastor out on it, okay? I, I mean, I'm, I'm all down with that, okay? And, and, then, uh, and so they're, they're, they had this fascination with their toys. And then the last one where he uh, said, uh, you know, I just got married. Well, in this culture, the, the wife would have been expected to come to this meeting too, all right? They're, all their excuses are based on the fact that they would not do something. And they easily could have, all right? They express inability, but here's the simple fact of the matter is they just had an aversion to going. Watch this. The people in this story and their excuses showed how little they valued their friendship with the banquet host. And why not just come solely out of the respect for the man? And look at this, what it says. So this is what the master's response is. He gets, he gets told about this and it says, the master, uh, the servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled and the blind and the lame. Now watch this. His attitude changes, doesn't it? He said, you know what? I'm going to invite people who will be glad to come. All right. In years of church work, I've seen that the greatest success often happens among those who are the least likely to be the benefit of it. Because God has always used Jennifer and I in years past to be, have strong voices in the areas of children, of students, and outsiders. But what a lot of people don't understand is that these, this group of people, they never bring money, all right? A teenager ain't never going to bring money, all right? Uh, a, a kid will never bring money. My little boy, I have to remind him, did you pay your tithe today? And one time he, he forgot a couple of weeks in a row. And you know how I lit the, uh, lit the spark in him? I said, you can spend no more money until you pay your tithes. How many of you know that tithe got paid that day? You know what I'm talking about? And you know what? Outsiders, that, will you and I begin to, we have to understand the culture that we live in now. People are designed to constantly be takers. 
And it wears on people. It wears on people who are faithful and been in church for a long time because they don't understand people not taking responsibility. One of the beautiful things about uh, ministering to children and, and teenagers, none of, they, all, they never bring money. They all bring their problems. And it takes a long time, if ever, for them to pay it forward. But when they do, you know what you've done? You've impacted a generation. And so that's what challenges and changes us to all the time. Man, we're going to be about the next generation. We're going to be about people who are far from God. Ladies and gentlemen, Coastal Church does not just exist to take care of the needs of the people in this church. Coastal Church exists for the people who have never darkened the door of this church yet. That the gospel, the Coastal Church exists for people who are waking up with a hangover this morning. In an alcoholic haze that the gospel will touch and transform them. And we see it every week. Verse 22 says this. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servants, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Look at this. Uh, I love how it says the roads and the country lanes. Some of your interpretation says the highways and the byways. All right. Now, here's what this is talking about. All right. So you already got handicapped people and, you know, the blind and the lame and everything like this, but there's still room. So here's what he's saying this. I want you to go after those migrant workers that have been, been working all day who work literally a hand-to-mouth existence. And I want you to go and, and, and after the long, hot day, come and invite them in. Now, here's the thing about it is I like it. It says, you're going to have to compel them. Do you know why? Because these people were likely to laugh in that servant's face saying, okay, what's the catch here? All right. You people ain't never invited none of my people to hang with y'all ever, all right? What, what's the catch? I mean, uh, why are you starting now? The only thing you do uh, to people around here, wealthy people, is exploit them. And half the time, you don't even pay us at the end of the day. And the master gives the servant this instruction. Here's what he says. When you see them, make them, compel them to come in. That word compel them means this. Let them know it's a sincere invitation. They're going to be shy and they're going to be modest and they're going to have a hard time believing that they're welcome. Tell them my master wants to honor his son who got married today. It would be both a disgrace to him and his son if his house wasn't full of people celebrating. Assure them, listen to this, these people worked for daily food. Tell them, hey, look, today is on me, okay? Bring your kids we're all going to get stuffed. We're all going to celebrate. And everybody's invited. You can come and eat with us. There, there's no catch. Here's the catch. We just want a full house. Okay? Because my master is wanting to lift up his son here. And here's the, uh, when it says compel them, here's the emphasis here. Don't leave until you've convinced them. All right? Now look at verse 24. It says this. So he says this. I tell you the truth. That not one of those men, those who were originally invited and turned them down, will get even a taste of my supper. All right? Now, here's what I like about this. The master's still mad about this ingratitude, isn't he? How could these friends who know him care so little about him and his families? This is a huge thing in their lives, and they wouldn't even honor him on this day. I have discovered some things about living on this planet, and it's this. Abused mercy often turns into the greatest wrath. You know what I'm talking about? Or perhaps those of you who are fans of literature have read the old passage that says, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. We're like, oh, dude, you, you are in for it now because you have, you, you know, mama, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So just bite the bullet and make mom happy. Here's the thing. It's one thing to be rejected, but it's another thing to have a special event or moment in your life recognized and not even taken seriously. Nothing stabs deeper than to give somebody a first-class invitation only to have it tossed aside for something less important. What would it have looked like if I'd have got that invitation to be in the Hall of Fame? And this was three years ago. And look, on Thursday nights, three years ago, that was great television. You know what I'm talking about? I don't like watching television except for like on Thursday night. I would build my whole week around Thursday night. All right? Look, I will handle your problems up until, uh, up until 6.59. But at 7 o'clock, whenever the office is on, I'm done. All right? And back in those days, it was the office and parks and rec. And so what, how, what would it have been like where I was like, hey, look, that's Thursday night. Uh, appreciate the invitation, but, you know, that's parks and rec night. 
And um, it's really nice to be invited. Just do me a favor. Drop the plaque off by my office. You know what their response would have been? It had been this. You didn't deserve to be in here based on your athletic ability as a teenager. And now you've shown that you're not worthy to accept it as an adult. You couldn't honor the purple and gold with talent, but at least you could have honored it with some humility. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what we've got to understand about life. In life, when grace is despised, grace is forfeited. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You see, the opportunity of a lifetime has to be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. And we have this open invitation from God to a lost and hurting world. And we should, you and I, part of our job as Christ followers, if we, if we claim that name is this, we should be compelling people that they haven't gone too far that the hand of God can't reach them. We need to be, that, that our God is a God who invites and loves no matter what. Just like that teenager who was telling me, hey man, I'm bringing my girlfriend this weekend. All right? Where we're saying, hey, look, he, he wants you. He loves you. And there's a place for you in his house. So today, if you're a, you're a Christ follower, maybe the question needs to be this. Am I regularly extending God's invitation? Um, are we inviting people? <clears throat> we so encourage this so much at our church that when you get your coffee, you've probably seen our invite cards. It has the name of our series and directions to our church and all of our times. Uh, we have them all over this campus. And some of you may have noticed, God, they even have this in the bathroom. Now, we don't have it near the toilet paper, but we do have it like when you're washing your hands because, you know, I'm still kind of a germ freak, all right? So wash your hands. You know, take a couple and be like, man, I, I know this this person at, uh, at work that's really, really struggling. And, and, and I just I want to let them know that they're invited. And, and so where we're asking this, this question now is, is our culture getting the message? Is our culture getting the... Uh, the the idea that our God is a God who invites. Did Jesus' culture even get it? Well, let's just check out four, uh, four chapters later. And we see that in Luke chapter 18, just a couple of days later, it says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd was going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And so I looked at this and this week when I was preparing, I was like, oh, man, they did it again. Man, Again, this is ugly religion at its best. People from the outside are refused access uh, to Christ by those on the inside. You see, Jesus is going to, to Jerusalem, and the, the religious people didn't want Jesus thrown off of his mission, especially by some stinky old smelly blind man. See, they, they were trying to protect the agenda because they thought that they were going to have key cabinet positions whenever Jesus came into his kingdom and his authority. So they're like, hey, man, as soon as we get there, the sooner we can have more power. And here's one of the things I want to tell you about the difference between a relationship with Jesus and having religion in your life. Because Jesus came to throw off. He came to expose the whole, the whole lie of religion. See, this is what religion does, okay? Religion always protects the agenda Instead of healing the hurt. I read this story not too long ago. And uh, it was February 3rd, 1990. In San Antonio, Texas, all right? This guy by the name of Paul Loach, he takes this really bad fall that punctured his lungs and it bruised some ribs and it caused some internal bruising. And so he's in the ER and he's drifting in and out of consciousness. And if he thought things couldn't get any worse, he was wrong. Because watch what happens here. The newspaper reports this. As he laid in the emergency room, two doctors got into a shoving match as to who would be the one that got to put the tube inside of his crutch chest. All right? One doctor is even threatening to, to call security on the other doctor. And here's the thing. He's laying in the bed and these doctors are shoving each other over his bed. And finally, Paul Lutz yelled out, Hey, will somebody please save my life? We live in a society where all the time needs are being ignored while opinions are being disputed. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? It happens in the church world too. Really? Give me an example. 
Last month, Christians all over America were talking about freaking blood moons and Shemitah years while people from the outside are like, hey, I just want to know who Jesus is. Could you help me out with this? And ladies and gentlemen, there's a whole culture that's saying, all I want to do is find Jesus. And this guy kept shouting, son of David, have mercy on me. And another thing that we see is this. Religion always puts method over motive. It has to happen this way. Really? What I like so much about this blind guy. One, one of the uh, chapters, it says this guy's by the name of uh, uh, Bartimaeus. All right? Something inside this man told him that God cared more about the condition of his heart than he did about the condition of his smelly clothes and his blind eyes. He thought, you know what? What I lack in having the right method, I can make up for by having the right motive. All right? My little boy, whenever he was two years old, gave me the greatest birthday gift I ever got in my life. All right? Now, Evan believes if the sun is up, he's supposed to be up. He got up at 2.30 last night and 3.30 uh, this morning, okay? Just like, hey, I can't sleep. Well, that doesn't mean that we can't, you know? So, <laughs> so he comes in and he gets his mother. And, um, and, but on this particular day, it was probably about 5.35 in the morning. And Evan is still learning sleep etiquette where when you wake up somebody, I mean, Evan will come in like mid-sentence. And, you know, I'm kind of a light sentence like, so, Dad, what are you doing, you know? So this particular morning... He is leaning over me, and he's opening up my eyes, and he goes, Happy birthday! It's 535. So he ca- happened to catch me at, the, at, a, at a pretty good time. And I was like, Oh, thanks, buddy. He's two years old. And, uh, and so he's just learning to talk, and so his English is a little bit broken. And he goes, I made a car for you, Dad. And I was like, Oh, dude, this is awesome. So there's this orange card with <laughs> some scribbles on it. He'd been like going to you know, pre-K and stuff like that. Uh, and so I didn't want to say, all right, what is this? I looked at him and I said, sit up here and read this to me, okay? Tell me what it says, okay? And so he, <laughs> he looks at me and, man, he is so little, he ain't got enough butt to put on a stamp, you know? And he sits, there, he sits in my lap and he goes, it's a happy birthday party for dad, all right? I was like, oh, yeah, oh, man, this is, this is so cool. And, um, and then later on, you know, he usually takes his mom's side in anything, but he got mad that there wasn't going to be a birthday party for me, all right? And it was like, Mom, uh, where's Dad's party going to be at? She's like, no, you know, when you get this old, you don't do birthday parties. And he's like, I mean, he looks at her crestfallen, and he goes, but Dad, birthday party coming up. And, and she's like, no, like, I think he secretly just wanted the cake. My little boy loves some birthday cake. You know what I'm talking about? And so, uh, and so I was like, no, buddy, it's okay. I mean, dude, he's, he's giving the stink eye to his mom. And I was like, no, buddy, it's totally cool. Don't worry about it. I said, oh, you're such a great son. He goes, well, you're a great dad. I mean, he's just furious, all right? But I, I'll, I'll never forget how much it meant to me that, dude, that, I, I, that little boy wanted to surprise me. And he wanted to show his love, even though it wasn't a birthday card per se. See, he had the right motive, so I was able to accept that. Look at verse 40. It says this. Jesus stopped. He hears this, and he ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him. Now watch this. Two words today that can change your life in this whole passage, and it's this. He stopped. Jesus stopped. If you study the Gospels, one of the coolest things you can ever see is that Jesus is never in a hurry to go anywhere. He's, it's never about the agenda. It's always about the person. There's never no passage that says that Jesus was in a hurry. <laughs> and the fact that he stopped demonstrates to us the heart and the character of God. And it's this. God always hears those who seek him. Our appeal may not be pretty or dignified or very attractive, but he hears it. And this blind guy, watch this, guys. This blind guy and my baby boy did what pleases the heart of God more than anything. They did the best with what they had. And in the eyes of God, in the eyes of his earthly father, that was enough. You see, Jesus told the prophets, Jeremiah, and 585 years before the story was ever even told, says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you, 
declares the Lord. And then it says that Jesus stopped, and then he asked this question in verse 41. It says this, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Now, they're sort of like, his faith healed him? How does his faith heal him? Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody told this guy that it didn't matter what he looked like or smelled like, that Jesus would heal him. And maybe they told him the story that they'd heard a couple of days before about this banquet where everybody, the blind and the lame and the poor, they were all welcomed there. Just a couple of days before, you see, this man, this blind guy, had confidence in the character of God, which is what faith actually is. It's confidence in God's character, not about how you've lived. It's about how God wants everybody from the uttermost to the guttermost to come around the table and do life together. See, in a crowd that told this guy to shut up, his faith only caused him to yell even louder. And here's the coolest part of the whole thing. In a crowd of disciples and family and friends of Jesus, a blind man had the clearest vision of God. Had the clearest vision of God. And Jesus looks at him and goes, dude, your faith has healed you. And look at what verse 43 says. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus. Jesus didn't say, follow me. You notice that? Here's the cool thing. Why does he follow Jesus? Because he's got nothing else to do anymore. He's been a beggar his whole life. He's been a blind guy his whole life. He's like, okay, I'm unemployed now. So maybe, you know, the rest of my life, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And here, he, he's not going to be begging anymore, so he might as well follow him. And he's walking with Jesus, and he's pointing at flowers that he could always smell but never see. He's looking up at the sun that he could always feel but never witness. He knew that the God of the Bible is a God who invites. And if the question today to Christ followers is, am I, am I extending God's invitation? Maybe the question to everybody else is this. How have I handled God's invitation? I was talking to a guy the other day, and we were talking about the challenges of culture because Jesus has a great name in society, ladies and gentlemen. He really does. Church, not so much. But, you know, even the academicians who... who it's hard to read the, the Bible and the accounts of Jesus and think that he's anything but an awesome guy. But here's the thing. Most people don't reject Jesus. They just don't give his invitation much thought. And here's the thing about our God. It's impossible to know about... about it is very possible to know about God's invitation and never accept it. To know God is to receive his invitation. Later on in the book of Revelation, it says in Revelation 3.20, it says, here I am, Jesus talking. I'm at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in with that person and they with me. And I'll spend life with you, no matter what your story is. I became a Christian at age 19. Followed Jesus and uh, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, all right? Um, those of you that spend any time around me only confirm that. Um, but I, I became a Christian, and here's what was so funny. that I got saved June the 9th of 1993, and then I preached my first message June the 23rd of 1993, all right? Th- th- it's not supposed to work out like this, okay? And I, I could not believe I was asked to do it. But for some reason, uh, my youth pastor asked me to lead the youth service. Uh, that night, and to preach, I was like, oh, I don't know if you want me to do this. He's like, yeah, man, God's, God's got his hand on you, you can do this. And I was like, okay. So filled the place up, preached, and, you know, some people got saved. Uh, by the way, uh, our hospitality director, my oldest sister, gave her life to Christ that night. And so I just, uh, and here's, here's the cool thing, was uh, I got, uh, I was on a baseball scholarship. And I went there, and um, I kept getting all these invitations to go and speak. And uh, I would just get up and tell what God had done for me, and, and people were getting saved. I didn't know why. And so, uh, almost, you know, uh, there are so many people that are like, hey, man, you going to be a preacher? I was like, no, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm pre law. And they're like, oh, my God. You know, these two things don't mix, you know. And, uh, but I kept getting all these invitations. I, I got asked to lead a Bible study. Dude, I didn't know anything about the Bible. 
Uh, but there was this guy that would send me like David Wilkerson's newsletters. And so I would like get over there and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to talk about this tonight. And I would lead a Bible study in Second Thessalonians and didn't know anything about it. But people were coming. They were giving their life to Jesus. And a revival broke out on that campus. I can't begin to tell you how many different times drunk people would throw rocks at my window and they would be bawling, crying, and somebody would have their arm around and say, hey, Chad, this, this person's ready to give their life to Jesus. Can you come down? I'm like, yeah, man, I'll do that in a second. More of my teammates were coming and they're like, hey, um, I, I heard you used to have, a, have some real you know, addiction issues and you're a part of the recovery movement. Like, yeah, was, yeah, how did you do this? I'd lead them to Jesus. The whole time, never having an idea of what God would have for me. One day, I, I slept in on a Sunday. And uh, I said, okay, so I'm not going to be at church. My roommates were, were gone. And uh, I just said, all right, I guess I'm going to have church in my room. And I turned on a TV preacher. And those of you that know me, I don't, I don't do a lot of TV uh, preacher stuff. If the TV's on, I'm probably going to be watching Sports Center. All right? There are some people like, did you see so-and-so preach last night? No. I get enough church throughout on Sunday. All right? Uh, but this particular day, I'm, I'm watching this guy. And it was just like me and God were the only people on the planet. And he said, wouldn't you like to do this? And I just said, you know, I've, I've been thinking. Maybe I was born to do this. But you know my past. I just, man, I just don't want to screw up anything. You know, I just... We were just a couple of years removed from the big televangelist scandal. That's what was marked in my mind about about ministers. And I was like, yeah, it'd be kind of cool, but... uh, And then that that TV preacher that always means so much to me, he said, I want to show you a passage. Somebody needs to hear this. It was in 2 Corinthians. He says, my power is made, is perfected in weakness. So the Holy Spirit says to me, you know what, if you will, if you'll treat this ministry call like you're treating your sobriety, um, just one day at a time, I promise I'll use you. I said, okay, I'll do this. I went in, I finished out the the year and uh, I went to my coach and said, hey man, um, I Coach, thank you so much for my scholarship, but I got to walk away from it. I feel like God's wanting me to go into ministry. And he just grinned at me real big. I thought he was going to cuss me out. And uh, he just said, hey, man, all of us can see this on you. He said, just, you know, yeah, absolutely, man. We're so proud of you. And, uh, and then he said, if this whole ministry gig doesn't work out, you can always come back. I was like, you know, I'm probably going to be taking you up on this. Uh, it's good to know that I got a scholarship waiting uh, there. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, what I had yet to understand is what many of us don't understand. The same God that invites us to know him in salvation wants to know you in your careers. He doesn't want you to dread having to go to work every day, especially whenever you feel like you were born for something more. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you in. You were meant for so much more. You were meant for a life to know him. And Jesus today is knocking on the door of those who have never accepted him and also knocking on the door of those who forgot um, that the door is open for everybody. He's finding all of us today because he sees people differently and he wants us to too as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for another opportunity I've had to share your word. And thank you that you still draw people in like only you can. And thank you that you still want to do something great with our lives change us like only you can lead us and where you lead us will follow in Jesus name with every head bowed every eye closed nobody moving the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts and lives today if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ or maybe you one time followed God but you but you've drifted and fallen away and you're here today and you're like PC I, I'm not right with God you know it or you've never begun your journey and you feel God speaking to your heart right now. I'm not going to call you forward or do anything to embarrass you or rob you of dignity. 
what I want to do is I just want to pray for you. If you're here today and you say, PC, I'm not right with God, would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand real quick? I won't do anything to embarrass you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, come on. Raise my pie. It's okay. Thank you. Opportunity of a lifetime. It's got to be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. Come on. The Spirit of God's here to speak to you. Thank you. Those of you with your hands raised, I just want you to pray this prayer with me. We're all going to pray this prayer out loud with you. You're part of the family of God now. Pray this prayer out loud with me, church. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you.